Hello, and welcome to my talk today, Thinking Outside the Box. It's going to be about insights that we've learned from the visually impaired community and how they affect and can be used for audio games development. So, the visually impaired community are hungry for immersive, substantive video applications. They've got desires, like everybody else, to play and do stuff. And, you know, they like computer games, same as everyone else. But there are very few computer games that they can participate in fully. But audio games fit that bill. And their desire is so strong that they will, you know, really, really engage with it and push for features and push for abilities and push for things such that being involved in this space kind of impels you to do more than you would otherwise for this platform. And that's the situation we found ourselves in, and that's what I wanted to talk a bit about today. Um, I'm gonna to talk specifically about uh, what adaptions we did for primarily targeting a visually impaired audience, and we're gonna look at what lessons we learned from that that might also have an application for general audience. So, first part of the talk is gonna be on insights, things we learned. Second part is more practical. It's practices how we implemented some of what we did. So. so Zazazu as a company um, sought to maintain leadership in the audio space uh, by basically pushing it to its limit, doing everything, doing the, the biggest, most immersive, um, complicated stuff. And complicated in the sense of like, Difficult implementation is not a problem for us, okay? We've got high quality people that can do high quality stuff. So with that engine, what can we produce? And we did stuff. We did, you know, some of the you know, groundbreaking stuff in both voice and on these audio applications. And that was great. It did not, however, lead to great commercial success, alas. Um, mainly because the mainstream audience is not really looking for that. This is what we discovered in the journey. That's how it goes. Um, but they were really successful with visually impaired people. They loved that stuff because no one else was doing it. And we'll get into some of the more details on that in just a minute. So because of that, we eventually gave up going into commercial production and we now just focus on producing stuff for the visually impaired community. So let's talk a bit about that community. They're, they're people, okay? And this is, you know, you know, it's obvious in one level, but another level um, that makes them difficult from a commercial point of view. Because again, we started from this from a commercial viewpoint. And when we looked at making a pivot, we said, okay, well, maybe if we target this community, we can make money there. Problem is, is they are, an in, they are not an interest group. I mean, if you get people into cats, you know, you can find forums and magazines, all sorts of about cats. You can buy advertising them and reach them. If they're into, you know, Civil War reenactment, you know, you can target ads at that sort of thing like that. They are not interested in being visually impaired. That is just what they are, who they are. They, they have interests all over the place. Um, and which means they're part of a general audience. And there's not a good forum or medium to advertise in that specifically targets them. There's not good search terms because they're not searching for visual impairment. They're searching for what they're interested in. So they're very hard to reach that way. Um, the other aspect is they are often on a fixed income. Okay. They don't necessarily have a lot of disposable income, a lot of cash uh, to throw around the place, which means if you're trying to like get some of that, there's not a lot there. And there's, a, you know, you're competing with everything else that they want to do. So, you know, that's kind of what they're like. And it's not really a commercial thing. So we, we, we just, you know, <laughs> this is not where you want to go commercial. So what are they looking for? Okay, well, you know, in many ways, they're just, you know, they're looking for what everybody else wants. They want to be entertained. They want to be challenged. They want to play games. They want to have all the fun that everybody else gets from playing a game. Now, that's how they're the same as everything else. There's a few differences as well. Uh, things they particularly like that work well with. One is empowerment. Frequently, those who are visually impaired are in 
a disadvantaged situation. Okay, they can't do certain things without help, or you know, it's it's they they have to limit what they do, what they can do on their own, and stuff like that. And so, giving them a game or an environment where they can, you know, accomplish stuff. You know, a typical gaming goal is they send a challenge, they achieve the challenge, they get a reward. Typical gaming cycle is very rewarding for me. It makes them feel empowered. Okay. Another thing that they're particularly motivated by is just the idea of a level playing field. They love playing games, and in audio, they are not at a disadvantage. Okay, any other game, you know, some games have been audio and enabled, they can kind of play them, but with audio games, they're not any different than anyone else. It's not like they've got something reading the text to them so they can understand it and they can go with it. Somebody else who doesn't have to go through all that is always going to be faster. With this, everything's the same. It's an equal opportunity platform. They like that. The other is to be able to give them a chance to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. When everything is controlled through audio, um, that's completely accessible to them as much as it's accessible to everything else. Okay. And it's not just the playing of the games. We'll get to some of the stuff up there, but it's also participating in the games in any number of ways. Come to So, the other thing about playing in the audio game space, uh, specifically for the visually impaired, is that you don't have to be Blizzard or, you know, a big games company to be able to produce something that's good, okay? They've got huge budgets. They can do a lot. But, to a visually impaired person, most of that doesn't matter. You know, you, know, you can have awesome visuals, great 3D rendering, and it doesn't matter to them because they don't they can't consume that. Consequently, that kind of brings, speaking of leveling the playing field, that kind of brings what you need to do down to much less, okay? So you just need to make their experience of your game better than their experience of these other top shelf games. It's an easier target. It's cheaper, okay? You know, visual video editors, 3D modelers, and all that sort of stuff. It takes an industry to produce a good quality video game. Audio games, you know, if you really want to go overboard on sound engineering, you can do so. But um, that is still nowhere near as expensive as attempting to do a full-fledged video game with everything else on top of it. So it's easier for a small company to play in that space. The other thing is all this together makes you focus on the gameplay, okay? You can take any gameplay that's available from Top Shelf Video Game, and as long as you can make it accessible through voice, you've got something they can produce and they can engage in, and they're happy. Okay, it gives you something that does well. If it's particularly suited to vision impaired people, they will end up liking it better than these expensive games that are out there commercially available. The other thing that I sort of hinted at before is ways they can participate is they have a thirst to create. Like most gamers, okay, certainly most of the gamers I know like playing the games, but they also like adding to the games. I mean, I spend more time writing game code than I spend playing games. Okay, a lot of people, they bring out the game, they bring out the, the mod content, okay? Some of it is a business plan in the sense that you have downloadable content now, you have all these extra things that um, game companies see as being advantageous. Uh, and people want to partake in it as well. And you know, sandbox games are, you know, they've turned that into the game. So content, content, content. People love good content. People like to participate. You can make them part of it, okay? They can, if you can, when you produce a game, if you not only produce the game, but to produce audio-enabled content editors for that game, you bring them into that loop, okay? For all the benefits the top tier game companies get. You know, if they're producing stuff for you, you've got more content, okay? The people who are producing it are really keen on the game and the content and getting all their friends to experience their content in the game. So you've got built-in advertising, they're a lot stickier and stuff like that. And again, it is very appealing to them because they can't normally extend another game. They can just listen to their friends adding mods to different things like that, but they can't do it themselves. Here they can. And it's not easy writing an audio editor to edit content for a game, but if you can write an audio-enabled game, you could probably also write an audio-enabled content. It's the same skills, the same techniques, and there's many benefits to it. 
Another interesting aspect of the visually impaired uh, players that I have is they have a much higher tolerance for complexity. The thing with, and one of the reasons that uh, audio games don't do big audio games, don't do so well in a mainstream crowd, is that to do anything substantive, they start to get complex. Okay, if you're just doing blackjack, you know, you've got three commands, that's it, you got a game. But if you're trying to do, you know, Fortnite, okay, there's, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. And it gets very verbose and time consuming. And mainstream people, just, they're just not going to spend the time. They'll go off and play a video game because it is more engaging. They don't have to do all of that extra work because they're using their full backgrounds. But for visually impaired people, this is all there is. So they're happy to master that complexity and do it. And the other thing is you have to look at it from their point of view, not your point of view. There's things that I think are terribly complex and unworkable, and they have no problem with them, okay? They are audio natives, okay? They understand this. They remember things much better than we do because we can just write something down and come back to it. They can't, so they just, they're just good at remembering that sort of thing. Um, case in point, I will sort of demonstrate something that came up in our fantasy game, Six Swords. There's all sorts of different items in the game. You can do stuff, you know, lot all our weapons you you whack people with and you know there was the desire expressed that they would love to be able to do it and i was like well you know we could do it but it would be really complex and they pushed me and they pushed me and said okay fine i'll just show you i'll do it and it's going to be unworkable so this is what you got into on the left hand side here you have you know a json blob of you know the actual record that represents an item you know the various characteristics that make up this item what it does you know how to describe it and you know, some stats about what you know it does like that and on the right hand side we have the part of the editor that i had to construct to enable you to create and update those records now you can imagine a dialogue box going to be pretty easy to do but when you have to do it in voice um, you get a lot of states, a lot of transitions between the states. Um, I'll get into the second half of this, the, the technique we use, this method of Loki. For now, just think of it as we produce a map that you then navigate north, south, east, west to go and address the different functionality. And this is kind of what it turned out like. There's more to it because it kind of goes off the edge in different places like that. But, you know, there's a lot of steps there. But that really wasn't a problem for them. You know, I found it really painful to test, okay? But once they got into it, they were like, okay, boom, boom, boom. And they, they were able to navigate and produce stuff with it because of that different level of hits. To give you a comparison, they also have the ability to create castles in the game. They can create rooms and stitch the rooms together. They create geographies of their own that they share with their friends and stuff like that. Here's an example. <laughs> <laughs> of one of these places that one of my players created. I mean, it's huge. It's much bigger than any content I've ever produced from the game, okay? And they're okay with this, okay? You know, this is something they produce, and it's not nearly as complex as what I thought was a really complicated editor. Design for them, not for you. Part of really understanding that is interacting with the community, getting their feedback, okay? Um, it's really great, you know, because they have a lot of insights into the game, you know, about, you know, what they think works and what doesn't. And, you know, they're there. It's for them. And, you know, if you're cited and you're producing this stuff, you kind of have your own handicap for trying to produce content that they think is great. And being able to interact with them, tons of good ideas. You know, I've got a massive backlog of stuff I need to do now or just like great ideas they've I've captured and they just sit in my issue tracker until I get time to do them because there's, there's so many. It's great. It's also, you know, very motivating and heartening. A lot of these people have had very difficult lives. And we can produce something for them that really matters to them and that they really care about. It's a great feeling. You know, that's what it is. It's not commercial. That's what keeps you going. It's good. But it's a difficult community to interact with, okay? You know, they're just people. They're visually impaired, but that doesn't mean they're all the same. Some people were born blind, okay? Other people uh, have partial sight. You know, it's degenerated or it's degraded or that they've lost some of it, but they still have a little bit of vision or they lost it later in their lives or whatever illness or uh, tragedy happened, affected them in other ways. So they often have other disabilities along with their, their loss of vision. And because of that, they all interact differently. You, we don't have, you know, we do a pretty crappy job of making uh, accessible software out there. Okay, and if somebody has been in the software industry for, you know, 
three decades and counting. Uh, I'm guilty of some of that too. I mean, often we just make a token effort to make it accessible. So different things work different well. And then when they have different levels of sight or abilities, you know, some of them are great typists and you'll know, listen like an email that's pages long, no problem. Other ones never type at all and they only use voice dictation. Um, so some of them like, you know, the ones we had success with, some people like Discord, uh, because they could just boom, you know, they can work through the navigator, hit a button and ring me. I get cold calls all the time and we chat and we talk and that, that's how we sort things out or, you know, interact sometimes a couple of us together. Others prefer, uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, that apparently is one of the more accessible mediums. Um, I had a forum up for a while, but it turned out to be not great, not very accessible. And so it was most often it's like, you know, my wife is typing this for me or, or something like that. It's just, it was, it was not good. So you need to find a medium. You need to bring it together and see what you can do with it to try just to talk to this. people. So that are some of the insights. Uh, let's get on to practice. Okay. How we put some of this stuff together. Now, uh, you may see in some of my other content, uh, one design technique that we've just taken and, and run with is something called method of Loki. It was originally implemented as a memorization technique. Uh, but the idea here, and you know, it, it just, to keep it simple is that you map functionality to a geography. You saw some of the graphs I showed earlier. They, um, you know, it, it's a little, it, it's like a map. Okay. But the idea is, is the functionality is in the places there. And this turns out to be good for a number of reasons. Uh, it rather, it works well for a number of reasons. One is that you know, for the same reason it works good as a memorization technique, we got certain biological wiring. This is what I've read about the science behind it is that we have certain biological writing that makes it easier for us to remember places and how to get back to them, especially if there's a reward involved. So we're leveraging that to make things that are easy to remember, easier to go back to by mapping it to <clears throat> something we can perceive as a physical geography. I mean, it's all well and good saying, you know, say one for this or two for that, or say yes or no. But when it's north, south, east, west, it just kind of clicks into something there. Uh, as an implementation thing, it's you know easy to implement because you've just got sort of, you've got cardinal directions to work with. Sometimes some of my apps use an up and down as well. Uh, it's easy to design for, you're literally laying out graphs in a score like that. When you get to overlapping situations, it's a little more trickier, but not rocket science. And the other thing is it's got a high accuracy rate for recognition, okay? For, and, and this is key, you know, a lot of design guides will say, make it be like talking to a human. It's like, then your user doesn't know what to say because you then have to train them in what to say. It's just North, South, East, West, they know what to say. And the application knows what to listen for. You know, it's not just generic, you know, text. It's, it's, you've got a smaller vocabulary, you get much accurate thing. And when you want somebody sitting in front of your machine and playing your game for hours, that is very important. Okay. Yes, it might be a little more awkward because they can't say buy or sell and they might have to go through an extra couple of north, south, east, west steps to get there, but it means it works. Okay. I have actually taken vocabulary out of the application and replaced it on their request with, you know, directional navigation because they know it will work and they don't have to work hard to pronounce things correctly. So that's method of Loki is all the stuff that I do here will mostly fit in with that. So Windows 3.1 came out and with it came the edit box, the check box, the push button, the radio button, uh, the drop down combo box and the other drop down combo box, but, and the menus. Set number of controls and then the world was built from that. And much of what we look at in a standard GUI application today comes from that, okay? We've been dreaming in the audio world of having a standard set of widgets that we could use in a similar way. And it's been a long, slow trek, um, but this, since we switched to direct feedback and just going for the visually impaired people, we've made a lot more progress, okay? At, because they have pushed us to producing more and more stuff for them and then the consolidation happened. So I'm gonna go through some of the widgets we've used to put stuff together and show how we put some of them together and how we end up with some reusable stuff. So, uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is the tree selector. And this really is just a set of stage of branching. It's like you're in one place, you go into the place, and you get the what you're trying, the task you're trying to accomplish is presented to you. 
You then can choose, if it's a two-level set, you choose north, south, east, west, or northeast. Depending on if you're saving one for an exit, you just choose three directions. That sends you into a category descriptor. And then from there, you can choose your final destination. Um, this really, again, you can do three, you can do nine, you can do 27. This gives a little bit cumbersome when you have 27, unless you have really good categorization. So I tend to use it mostly when there's like nine choices and you have the control over the number of choices. So I choose the nine things to present. They get presented there. It works well if they can break down into three categories. And it's very easy for them to navigate. You can go into there, you can see your choices, you make your second stage, and then you make your final choice. Uh, when you've done that, the last box with the answer can either be, oh, you action their request and send them off to their next task, or you know that's where they manipulate whatever they're doing, and then they can walk back out again and go to another one. Uh, the sort of places we use this in is when sort of they're hiring a new person into their party in this fantasy game. These are all interview rooms. You can go and look at different people and come back out and go to other ones. And so you find the people that you want to bring into your party and, and hire them. Um, because you can go in and out again like that. It's very easy to navigate, very easy to remember what things are. Uh, we also use this for bookmark selection, uh, both for setting and uh, retrieving bookmarks uh, for the various places that they've been. Again, you have a set number. You can have up to nine bookmarks. You can go to the ones. You remember where they were. We also give them descriptive names as like all the category one is red and you have a red circle, red check, red X, and the green circle, green check, green X, stuff like that. So it fits well with this sort of thing. Uh, another sort of widget we came up with called the carousel selector. That's when you have a, a number of things to choose between uh, and either it's a, a weird number, like if you can't make it nine, it's going to be less than that, or it's a variable number. But it could be different ones at different times. Like one of the examples we have there is like choosing an item from your inventory. You don't know how much they're carrying. Uh, and, you know, this works best for three to seven choices, but uh, it can work and function for that person who just carries everything. The way it works is you move into the selection thing and it describes to you what you've currently selected. You then have the choice, the lateral choices, east and west usually, to go to previous or next to let you sort through that list of selected things. So you go west, it gives you the next one and says, this is now what's selected. West, this is now selected. When they're satisfied with their selection, they can move forward, say call it north, and action whatever it is that they're doing. Okay, if they're gonna be like transferring something or something like this, uh, selecting a pet, selecting the active uh, NPC, that happens there like that. Otherwise, if it's just a toggle, you can come back out again or something. But that's the idea is that you have this kind of window into a set number of choices and you can cycle between them. If you can sort them in the order of the most needed first, that's a good thing because it saves extra steps. But if you don't, you can still get to everything this way. It takes a few more steps, but it works. Now there's some things where you just have too many, okay? Uh, in that um, item selector we've built, uh, we wanted you to be able to make the items summon a monster when you hit something with it. It's a um, common fantasy trope. Trouble is, we have like you know 400 plus monsters in our in our in our little dictionary, and you know we don't want to do voice recognition because that's really hard because you know some of them have very strange names, uh, and it's just very inaccurate, and we want to stay away from that anyway. So the key was to we essentially had a, a stacked set of carousel selectors, where the first one you go into, the next previous you do with your east-west uh, changes, what you're selecting is not the final thing, but the filter you're going to apply to that. You know, for example, in the example of selecting a, uh, a monster, you might say, okay, currently selected monster type is animal, well, I go one to the right, and now uh, it's saying it's selecting uh, humanoids or another one, now it's selecting dragons, etc., etc. but you're choosing your category. When you go forward, call it north, uh, then you get to the point where you're actually choosing amongst the animals or the dragons or whatever it is you've categorized. So now you're going through the list of what you desire, but it's been filtered. If you say, you know, it's not what you want here, you can always go back to the category selector and choose a different category. Um, so that's great, and it can greatly expand uh, how you select things like this. Um, in the end, to get to those 450 monsters, we actually had, I think, three levels of categories. Um, so you can stack them as deep as you want. The main caveat is that your categories have to sort of evenly describe what you're selecting amongst. Because otherwise you get some categories that have like two things in them and some that have 30 things in them. And that is a problem. And um, you need, so it really depends on your feature set, how exactly you divide it all.
So um, another sort of example we used was in setting um, a price on something where the first category was like, do you increase or decrease your target number by one? The second category is increase or decrease it by 10, et cetera, et cetera, for whatever range of stuff you need like that. So that was a nifty invention. Now, the one thing we couldn't get away from was text entry. There's no, you're not going to do like in a PlayStation where you have to left and right to pick letters to type something in. It's tedious on a PlayStation. That would be terrible on, on voice to sort through, you know, you know, I'd like to buy a vowel or, you know, something like that. It's just, it's, it's just too painful. So we did kind of break our rules there and we did have a generic text entry thing. I have written, written a whole location editors using text entry, but even with 90% accuracies, trying to speak two lines of text, you know, one word in 10 is going to be wrong. You're going to have errors in it. It's not great. But for short text entry, it's all right. So you navigate through the location stuff to somewhere where it says, okay, you're now editing this particular thing. Then you can say edit and then the text of what you want. It repeats it back to you for confirmation and you might have to cycle a few times, but you get it right. So for short names like, you know, the name of your party, the name of your character, the name of your pets, that's fine. We did experiment because again, in interacting with these people, a lot of them are using uh, speech to text and it comes out I and mean, we've all seen the jokes about Siri, you know, it all comes out funny sometimes. And, you know, at times is, you know, about as hard to understand as my teenager. Um, but you know, you kind of like do it enough and you eventually kind of get the hang of it or you kind of work through it. They do this all the time. So they have much less trouble with it than I have with it. So we experiment with slightly longer things and we're not up to like, kind of like one sentence text entry now where we have like a notice board. And again, we talk about communication. If you can get communication in the game, you're rocking. So we have a notice board where they can post notices about things. There's also a bug report feature. They can go and you know enter a bug report that I get emailed. And um, again, great for soliciting feedback. So that's like another sort of widget like that. So taking these and putting them together. So we talked about like individual controls. Now we talk about some of the like dialogue boxes that have built built with these. And it's not just building a specialized, you know, the item editor was a very specialized solution for a specialized task. Uh, but many things that we're going to talk about here is things that come up with that solve a broader task or that have been used in multiple places in multiple ways. Uh, one of them we call the podcast listener because that's kind of what it was first invented for. It's like, you know, I had a little news service in the game where I could give like updates or we just released something and here are the bug fixes, here are the new features. Um, but you want to want to keep that short because you know they hear it whenever they log into the game. So I wanted a longer format. And I'm like, well, you know, podcasts make sense. But rather than go to an outside source, you know, like and host a podcast somewhere, I said, well, why don't I put it in the game? And they're already there. You know, it keeps them tied to it. You know, it's an idea. So that was the origin of this. And you know, you enter into the location where the podcasts are. Um, and in my case, I actually, there's several. I have one, one of my users has his own podcasts. And so you actually enter from the back of the tavern, you go into there and you have a kind of like a tree selector that lets you choose which podcast you want to listen to. You go into the room for that podcast and you've got like a carousel. You know, the first thing it does, it describes, gives you the title of the current episode. If you don't like that, you can do East West to go to the next or the previous episode until you've selected the episode you want. And then you go forward North and it will then play that episode for you. And you can sit there and listen to the podcast about whatever the content is. And when it's done, it returns you back to that room and automatically advances to the next episode. So if you just want to go through them, you can go through them, listen to that. Okay, well, I'm done. Oh, let's listen to the next one. Or it's like, I want to skip this one or I, I missed something there because I had to walk out of the room. Let's, let's listen to it again. Uh, it's a great way for going through content. Uh, and we use it for podcasts, obviously. But I added a, like a mail into the game. So when somebody makes a bug report, I can actually write back to them, either asking for more information or giving a status on that. Um, and it's done the same way. You walk into the mail room and it says the subject line of the current email. And you can go between them and choose which one to listen to. Same control, same sort of thing. Uh, we even started putting reference material in there. And that works really good with the tree selector. So it's like, okay, what category of information are you looking for? You go into there and then you can then choose again and you get a podcast listener type control that lets you iterate through the content at a high level and then dive down and hear the details on it. So it was great for providing that information about the game from within the game. So that was one we used a lot. Another one, 
uh, which has been very useful for uh, getting feedback. Again, was our survey. And this is not quite one of the standard widgets, but it's a way that sort of they work together. So the idea is, is you decide to take the, t the um, survey, which is in the back of the lounge in the tavern. You go into there, and the first room you go into poses the first question. Okay, you know, how do you think we're doing with our game? And, you know, go north for, you know, it's more stable than it was before. Two, it's less stable than it was before. Go, start, go east for less stable. Go south for, uh, it's about the same. And then you save the back direction for either as exit the survey or to go to a previous question. But once it records that answer, it then moves you to the next question. So by traversing a series of rooms, the exit you choose chooses the answer to the next question and it you know, builds up and then submits a survey. And you know I put stuff on my server to collate these and I can check them now and again to see what their direct feedback is to me through this. You know, Because not everybody's on one of these forums that I talked to. So um, that was a useful sort of widget that's been used in this way by stringing them together to create content like this. Nested geographies uh, have proven to be extremely important and were really actually groundbreaking. And, and it started with that item editor. Um, I didn't want to, you know, I could have wired it into the location somewhere, but often they're, you know, originally I had it, they had to go to a particular location to use this to do their stuff. But that was awkward. I could see it was awkward. So they ended up making an item called an anvil, and when they said use anvil, it transported them to that geography. Now the key was it was nested. So wherever you are in the geography of you know the functionality of the world you're exploring is remembered and kind of pushed onto a stack and you're now in this new place. Okay. You can then navigate around there accessing that geography to do the task that you're done. And when you're done, you can exit that geography. And it returns to you where you were before. So it is literally like a dialog box popping up. And you can do this in any levels of nesting that you want. Um, you know, you're in the middle of that. We used a help office, which I'll give in more detail later. You can call out from in something, something else, and it pops into that, and you just pop the stack back up. Programmers understand stacks. They're really easy to do. Once you've got one, you've got this huge, powerful thing that you can do all sorts of stuff with. Um, so that proved to be extremely powerful. Um, it can even be used to... You don't have to always go back. You can change where you go back to. And that's how our bookmarker worked. That when you're in a location you want to remember, you use your map. And that transports you to a geography, which is the map. You can navigate through your tree selector to the red check and say, I want to make this red check my current location. It says, good on you. And you can go to, say, the green circle and say, oh, yeah, that's this other place. I want to go there. And you activate it there. And when you leave, it's changed your, you know, it's like changes one up the stack. So you're now in that new place. That's how we did the bookmarker. It's a very handy thing. Uh, so wrapping a bunch of these things together, uh, let's talk through the help office. You know, we had help in the game. We had, you know, we could say help and it gives you help. Um, you can say help topic and we give you help on that topic. But again, you don't always know what you need help on. And um, there's only so much so far you could take that. So, you know, it clicked one day the idea of like, okay, you know, let's have a help office. You say help and it gives you some help, but it says, hey, if you say help again, you go to the help office. And so if you say basically help twice, boom, teleports you out of the geography you're in into this help office. So it says, hey, go around this place, see what I can do for you. So that's using the nested geography idea. So say you go to the left from here, or west, uh, you go into the shop, which is a, uh, we'll sell you utility, it sells you like the map and, you know, things that are generally you, you, game utilities, okay? And that's a carousel selector. You can go north and south there, just toggle between the different items and west to purchase it, and east sends you back to the, the headquarters of the help office. There's that. North sends you into the information depot, and that again is like a tree selector leading to podcast listeners. You know, from there you can go to different reference libraries to, re you know, read material about the game or you can go and read what your email is so it means that you have because that's a function it's not within the game it's outside of the game so by putting it in the help office it's accessible to them wherever they happen to be go there do this stuff come back here and again straight east for the main health office is i mean another carousel selector where you know people would sometimes get stuck you know they either get down into a dungeon and they get lost or they're off in the wilderness don't really know where they are and it's frustrating for them, and it's difficult to do support for. Uh, so we added this unsticker in the game. So you can go into there, and you go in one direction, and it will like, okay, let's just move you 
basically pops your geography stat. Let's, let's move you back to the surface. You know, gives you back to the base level geography, puts you in a known location. Going south, sends you to the starting point of the game. Uh, starting point, not starting state. Um, and it gets, I see people using it all the time. It sends me a little email when it happens because I want to keep track of people misusing it. And, you know, it's, 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 it's quite popular. People use it a lot. Go a bit further to the west and you're in the bug reporting. And that's, that's a simple text entry thing. They can say, okay, edit. Hey, such and such isn't working. Confirm it. And then it sends me an email reporting the bug. And they can go back to whatever those are doing. That's also been very popular. I get messages all the time now. But because they can do it and access it from any point in the game without disturbing their gameplay, it works really well. So that's a case where we've taken a number of simple widgets and we've put them together into a cool piece of functionality here that's made a good help to the game. So I've talked through some insights, sort of what it's like developing for the visually impaired, some of the, the, the interesting things you get out of that. And I've given some practical ideas of, uh, of the implementations that can take advantage and do stuff with that. So overall, you know, it's very interesting working with them, okay? They will encourage you to push the platform to its limits. If you want to do great things, they will, they will push you and you will do things you didn't think you could, could do. Um, their feedback is excellent. They are voice natives, okay? And, you know, they will think of things you haven't thought of, okay? They will tell you when something is like, is, is terrible. Uh, and you will find out, and they're not shy about their opinions. They will, will tell you when something is not working for them. Um, so it is great for rapid evolution and rapid improvement of your audio properties. Now, the other side of that is that they are different from the mainstream, okay? As we've mentioned, they have different tolerances. Uh, different goals, okay? And that's something you need to bear in mind. Depending on what your goal is, you need to take that into account. Uh, <clears throat> most of the hardware vendors these days are doing everything they can to add screens and stuff to uh, their audio devices, which start out as a simple audio interface. Now you've got different firms that you know, more or less end up being smartphones. It's like, I'm not sure why they're doing that and not just licensing smartphone software, because that's kind of where it's all going. Um, if that's your market, this is less useful because, you know, visually impaired people are not going to give you feedback on the screen. And there may be better metaphors that work better when you have a mixed, you know, text and screen and you do the stuff on voice. And then when you really need to, you go to the screen. And that's a very good approach if you've got a mixed hybrid solution, but that doesn't work for visually impaired people. So you're not going to get good feedback on that. So it really depends on what you're aiming for. So you have to look at them. They will push you. They will push you to do really good things and can be a rapid, you know, rapid accelerant to your development. But that's if you see them as being the future. If you think that uh, voice first or voice only is where you want to be, that's great for that. If it's not, then they're more of a niche, okay, in the sense that they were the really good things for that part of the application, but you have to take them in the context of your larger goal. So it depends on your business goals, what you're going to get out of them. I'm presenting you the information here you get to make your own choices.